Okay, it's now three minutes past. Shall we start? Uh, Simone, I don't know if you want to do an intro bit first of all. Hi everyone, this is Simone. Thank you very much for coming to the webinar today. Just a few housekeeping um, that I've listed here. Uh, just to say that you can feel free to make comments in the chat window um, during the session and raise questions, um, but just note that the moderators can see your chat. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be available following the session on our website, so stay tuned to our website um, if you'd like to come back to the, to the session. Um, I've put a link in here that you can contact Blackboard Collaborate directly if you have any sort of technical queries during the webinar. And they're pretty quick on that, so if you'd like to copy that link, I'll, I'll put it in the chat in a few moments. And um, yeah, and just to let you know that there will also be a question and, and, and answer session after the presentation. So even though you'll be listing all those questions in the chat, Martin will be picking up on a few of those in the last 10, 15 minutes of his presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, over to me then. Right, um, so the talk's called The Battle for Open. Um, so I hope it's got quite a bit of ground to cover in this one. Um, so we'll see how we get on. Right, so I'm writing this book, okay, called The Battle for Open. Uh, I've been doing it for the past couple of months, so I'm with those uh, academic necessities, a glass of wine, uh, so that's and an iPad. <coughs> uh, this is the first time I've really given the talk about the whole book, so uh, you're kind of guinea pig. We'll see how it goes. Um, there's quite a lot of stuff to get through. Um, so there's kind of a central theme to the book, um, which is that openness as an approach is one in many ways. It's kind of been victorious, but almost at, at this point of victory, it's kind of this is when the, the real battle for what openness means starts, really, and there's lots of different fronts on which that, that, that battle takes place. So this talk, um, <coughs> uh, I'm going to look at some of the roots of open of the modern open education movement. Um, briefly think about why openness has been successful as an approach, and then I want to look quite quickly at four areas of open education. And for each of these, think about kind of what the major breakthroughs have been, uh, and what the kind of tensions are, what, what what the battle areas are now. And I want to then talk about uh, the battle for narrative, and last the end with some conclusions. So in doing this, in any of those four areas, you can probably guess what they are, MOOCs, Open Educational Resources, those kind of things. Any one of those is a, is a presentation on its own, really. So I'm not going to be able to go into a lot of detail on those, uh, but hopefully enough to get across the, the main point. Uh, first of all, um, you know, why call it a battle? I think you know, lots of people are uncomfortable with kind of military-style language. <laughs> but I think the reason why I think it's a battle are, it is revealing itself. So I think there are three main reasons why you can think of it as a, as a battle. Um, and the first is that there's kind of real areas of conflict, there's all kind of value judgments that we're often we're fighting about. In open education people believe certain things, and a lot of people who are coming in or are new to the game have other directions they want to take uh, open education. So there's kind of real areas of conflict that are, that are being fought over tonight. Um, similar to that, and as in most battles, there's actually stuff of real money out there. Real value is to be won. You know, there's the uh, if you look at the educational publishing business, it's worth you know, billions of dollars, you know, globally. And, and higher education itself is a massive industry. <laughs> and so um, there's kind of real money in there. It's not just a, a small kind of semantic argument. Um, and the last one is about the, the, the phrase, you know, the, the, the victor writes history. And I feel this kind of battle for the for who tells the story and which story gets told around open education. Um, and we're seeing that come to the fore quite a lot over the past year or so. So I think these are kind of three areas where the, the term battle makes it justified, I think. <coughs> Sorry, I have a cough, so if I keep coughing and that's hurting your ears, I apologise. Uh, so first, I said I was going to look at some of the roots of modern uh, open education. <coughs> um, I think they're kind of four areas really that it kind of really draws upon. Um, the first is the, the open universities, open access entry. And, and each of these areas really brings something different to what it means to be 
to talk about open education. Which means that often when we talk about openness, we're talking about different things depending on which of these we're, we're bringing to the fore. So open universities were really about open access, open entry into education. And so uh, you know, the Open University in the UK was focused and uh, established in 69. And the focus there is really on methods and removing barriers. It doesn't really um, so much focus on, on the free aspect, you know, trying to make education accessible to lots of people. And they assume that the free part or the money part would be handled by governments. Um, later on, the idea of free software came along. And that's very much about free as in freedom to, to do stuff, not free as in cost. Um, so there are the, the things around purpose, you, so the four freedoms that you, you're free to see kind of what to use it for your own purposes, you're free to change code, you're free to redistribute it, and you're free to distribute um, your modified version. So the emphasis there is really on uh, control. Uh, open source software is, is similar. Um, but this is really about the emphasis here is on efficiency and the idea that, you know, uh, Raymond, the, the, uh, Eric Raymond's famous quote, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are showers. It's basically, it's, just, it's a really good way to work to get lots of people to look at stuff. I think the last aspect of Web 2.0 that's important came from, uh, last aspect of open education came from Web 2.0, and that's a slightly naff phrase, we don't use it anymore. <clears throat> but that kind of really opened up this whole, like, this whole culture of sharing and open practice and, and you know, putting stuff out there and freely distributing it. So I think what you get together is these things coming together around what we think of as open education now. Um, so in many respects, uh, I want to avoid a definition of open education. I think you could give one, but I think that would close off lots of uh, avenues. And so um, I like to think of it as a kind of a set of this is a very academic thing to do, isn't it, to avoid the definition. <laughs> it's a set of coalescing principles that come out of those four areas. So, you know, the freedom to reuse content and material, uh, open access to content, uh, sometimes free cost, you know, often free equals open in many people's minds. The e easy use as well, being able to get stuff and share it easily. This idea of digital network content, sharing it and passing it around the network. Um, often social community-based approaches, so, uh, of how people go and creating content. Um, for a lot of people in open education, it's really a very ethical argument and an altruistic argument. This is what education should be doing. Uh, but also, um, if you look at some of the work around uh, learning objects and open education resources, the idea that it was actually just a, a very efficient model, and certainly things like open access publishing, you know, the argument is that if you want to distribute your knowledge, your research, then open access publishing is just an efficient way to do it. So even if you don't take the altruistic argument. So I think you can see there are a bunch of things that come together, and maybe some of these things are more important to some people than others, but they're kind of a big, a big soupy mess, if you like, that make up open education. Um, so I've really skimmed over the history there. Uh, there are two things I'd direct you to. Uh, first of all, David Wise has got a really excellent uh, video um, about kind of where open education came to, particularly relating to the free and open source uh, software movement. So uh, look at that video there. Uh, and uh, Sandra Peter and Mark Steeman have a really good paper on a much longer view of openness education, going back to coffee houses in the 17th century and stuff. So if you want a much kind of more informed view, I'd recommend their, their paper. <coughs> so the first of these four areas I'm going to talk about is uh, open access publishing. Uh, so raw map, uh, keep a list of uh, open access policies. Um, And they've sort of been uh, logging these for number one. You see there's a big increase. Kind of, the, the trend is one way. So basically, you know, open access policies are, are, on, are on the move. People are um, taking them up and so at national level or institutional level, saying that anything that's funded by research councils has to be made uh, um, openly available. So there's been some real kind of major breakthroughs here. I mean, a few years ago, you know, I was one of those open access nuts advocates and I wouldn't review a paper unless it was an open access journal, I wouldn't publish unless it was an open access, but it often felt like a kind of minority sport really, you know, um, and you felt you were fighting the, the, the big publishers and within a few years it's become part of the mainstream. So if we take uh, open access publishing with the, the common definition of free online access to scholarly works, uh, in most countries there are kind of major policies now, so uh, in the UK we have the Finch Report, uh, in the States there are um, uh, a number of mandates from different funders, and in Denmark there's a 
there's a policy that all, all uh, funded research has to be uh, made available and so on. So a lot of countries have major policies that anything that's funded uh, through uh, public money has to be made uh, open access and available. So uh, there are two routes, as many of you know, the gold route, which is often called uh, author pays, but really it's usually that the research council pays, so you pay to have an article made open access, or green route, which is uh, self-archiving either on your own or an institutional repository. Uh, Wiley did a, a survey of their authors last year, and they found that for the first time ever, more than 50% of published open access. Uh, so, that's, so it's really become part of the mainstream now, and it's really kind of broken through. And one of the uh, common cited things is what's called the uh, open access impact advantage, which says that uh, papers that are published open access uh, tend to get more views and often more citations as well. Um, I think there's a real, I think social media creates a real imperative for open access here. So uh, stuff that's shared by um, social media needs to be accessible. There's no point me, me saying on Twitter, here's a fantastically interesting article, and when you click on it and go to it, it says, pay $50 to read this article. Now, you may as well go and bury it in your back garden for that, that's worth. So social media has kind of really driven the open access argument, I think, because people want to be able to share content. So open access seems like a big win in many ways. Um, <clears throat> and here's a paper that was in PLOS uh, in 2011, sort of plotting that, the, the growth of open access journals and, and articles. And again, the, the graphs are kind of all going one way here. So what's the, what's the area of battle here, if you like? Um, well, you know, unsurprisingly, you know, um, publishers who make an awful lot of money out of uh, academic publishing weren't just going to go quietly into the good night. Um, so there are issues around the gold route where we pay publishers, and some people have argued that it will lead to, to the Matthew effect, which is kind of you, you gather more and more around the same people. So if you're a successful researcher who can afford to get research grants that will then afford to pay uh, gold route publishing, then um, you tend to get more articles published. And if, you, if you're not of those, then you'll struggle. Uh, it could be more expensive. Um, there's no real incentive for uh, publishers to, to innovate, really. That just, the money just shifts from libraries paying them to, uh, to researchers paying them. It, it doesn't really matter. Um, we've seen people like Elsevier being quite uh, aggressive in this. So they ordered a takedown notice on academia.edu. Um, for anyone who's putting up their papers there. And when you think about it, if you're an academic and you want to um, have a profile on some of the academia that edge you, then your papers form quite a strong part of your academic identity. So that takedown notice is really impacting upon your ability to have an open identity online. <clears throat> we see lots of um, predatory open access journals. So these people come and say, yeah, we're open access. Look at our catalogue of 700 journal titles we have. Uh, and basically, they'll just pay to publish. So they'll publish your paper as long as you give them money and there's no kind of quality threshold. Um, and there was a, an article in Nature that many of you may have seen, uh, seen recently, about a kind of fake article uh, that someone tried to get through and lots of uh, open access uh, journals accepted it. And I think what that talks about, there's a book called um, What Money Can't Buy. And the guy argues that um, when you introduce money into some things, into some relationships, it changes the nature of those relationships. And as soon as we're paying journals to publish an article, I think it changes the nature of that relationship between the author and the journal. Uh, and perhaps worst of all, there are, are the hybrid models where you pay to have an article published open access, but also at the same time paying, uh, charging libraries for subscriptions to that journal. So they get money from two directions which seems unfair and extreme. So you can see that there's kind of real tensions around here. It seems like a, a moment of victory, but in a way that, that it, we're only just beginning to, to negotiate what all this means. Uh, OERs, <coughs> this is our Open Learn site. So Open Educational Resources. Slightly different story with these. Uh, major breakthroughs here. So Open Courseware was launched in 2001, and we had learning objects earlier. So they've been around for a good time. They're kind of they're mature in educational technology terms. Uh, there are repositories all over the globe in major languages and all, in all major areas. Uh, the Open Courseware Consortium has 260 odd institutions signed up to them. Uh, and more recently, we've seen some really good work, particularly in the States, about open textbooks, where we've seen really good savings for students and uptake of these things. So um, open educational resources kind of 
chugged along in its own way without the tunnel being quite as uh, splashy as some of the other things, but, but gained a good um, a good break, I think. So uh, I work on the OER research hub at the OU, and we're looking for impact of open education resources. Uh, these aren't all our findings, but these are the type of findings that you come across. So we're seeing um, quite a bit of evidence uh, through surveys and stuff for an increase in things that kind of surround performance, if you like. So there might not be, it's very difficult to point out and say, these people used OER and therefore their grades went up 20% because often there are too many confounding variables. But um, you're seeing things like, you know, students reporting they're more enthusiastic about study, that they've increased interest in the subject or they've gained confidence, those kind of things, since using OERs. Um, We've found that it might have an impact on retention, largely as a, as a result of reduced cost. You know, if you're struggling to afford to pay stuff, having access to free things is good. Um, an area that I think is underexplored with OERs is how they affect um, existing students. So uh, we found that a lot of, about 20% of uh, OpenLearn students, uh, OpenLearn users, are people who are already studying in formal education. They're using it to kind of complement, supplement their studies. And similarly, we found um, people look at a lot of OER before they take a formal course. Um, this study, Phil himself, found that 47% um, of students purchase paper books, but 93% of them would read the free book. So there's kind of real educational boost there. And if a book costs $100 or there's a free version, people go for the free one. And so you know, if, if a lecturer's talking about a, a set book and, and half the class haven't got to it, then that's going to have an impact on their, their education. Uh, so OpenStax uh, is a, an excellent project in the States. They've had big download numbers. So they're, they're producing textbooks in the kind of main subject, statistics, psychology, those kind of things. Uh, and they reckon they kind of save students about $3 million um, for those who downloaded those. I mean, th these are, some of these savings are quite difficult to quantify because they're looking at things, money that people would have spent, but they might not have spent it really. But the, those are the type of savings they're looking at. <coughs> so I mentioned we have a research hub, and one of the things we have there is um, an impact map. You've got 11 hypotheses, and we're trying to uh, map the impact of OERs across the world. So you can go there. So OERresearchhub.org is the site. Uh, at the moment, it, the, the impact map's at chaos.open.ac.uk, but we're going to get a, a nicer URL. But you can go there and, and log uh, research impact of OERs if you have any to hand. <coughs> so what's the area of battle with OERs? Um, I think it's less pronounced than with open access in a way. Um, one of the questions people ask about it is, is there enough impact? Um, you know, has it been significant enough given the investment that's been into it? Uh, there was a survey out recently about the Open Course Library. It was a strange survey because it was conducted by uh, on-campus bookstores who aren't necessarily the people who would benefit from uh, open, open textbooks or where people would go to get open textbooks. And they found, but anyway, they found that the use of uh, open textbooks is quite low. <clears throat> um, and so it might be that um, that's an indication that perhaps people aren't aware of them or that uh, it could be that for academics who changing the course they've been teaching for years on a particular textbook to use a, an open textbook is a, is a kind of cultural barrier there. Um, Pearson have launched their open class, a kind of uh, online VLE for people to go and use based around OERs, and there's a kind of slight suspicion around that, you know, are, are we trying to lure people into, time people into a platform with OERs? Uh, and I think in some ways, we'll go on to this next, um, some of the, the OER thunder has been rather stolen by, by MOOCs in a way. They've sort of come on more recently. And is there, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, but in general, I think uh, OERs are, are, are a sort of quiet success story, really. And perhaps it's because they've come from inside higher education and have been sustained through that rather than um, going up kind of directly against kind of commercial interests. So on to MOOCs inevitably, David, there's your image, thank you. <coughs> now MOOCs kind of came a bit from nowhere, I mean it didn't come from nowhere for some of us, um, but in terms of general awareness, so the, the, the blue graph this is using Google Trends, you know, if in doubt do a Google Trends graph, you're sorted. Uh, so blue is uh, OER awareness and, and red is MOOCs, it goes you know, nothing, 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 and then boom, out of nowhere uh, MOOCs come along and kind of overtake it. So you think, wow. You know, that's really good 
um, awareness. But just in case we think we're really important, if you think something's interesting, uh, a good comparison is to do a, a, a do a Google Trends against Kim Kardashian, and you'll see that MOOCs don't 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 qualify anywhere against Kim Kardashian. So we're not really that uh, important. Um, <coughs> who is Kim Kardashian? It's good, but I didn't know either. But that that is the measure of internet uh, knowledgeability. So. Um, Uptake. So we have all these companies that have sprung up from nowhere: Udacity, Iversity, Coursera, Open to Study, FutureLearn, edX. So you know, big offerings. All, all of them offering MOOCs, and often with kind of really large registrations. I think we we don't see in the kind of hundred thousand people signing up for a MOOC anymore, but we're still getting registrations in the sort of twenty thousands, those kind of things. Uh, Coursera said last year that it had passed seventeen million enrollments. So these are big numbers. I mean, we can argue about what the numbers mean, but they're they're still big numbers. Um, there's been a big kind of media awareness. So in the UK, they appeared on Newsnight, our kind of big news program. They've been in the New York Times and stuff. All that. And it did feel like, you know, for years you've been banging on about uh, open education, and you'd be lucky if you could get someone in open education monthly to talk to you. Uh, or I felt like at least we were talking to the, the same people. Uh, and suddenly everyone wanted to know, you know, uh, vice chancellors were on the phone to you, newspapers on the phone to you. Tell me about MOOCs, you know. Um, so George has this uh, quote, you know, if education was grunge, then MOOCs were like it, it's Nirvana, uh, the, the, the kind of breakthrough act, if you like. I think it's, it's probably a bit hard to classify education as grunge, a kind of niche movement, but, uh, but I kind of know what he means. <clears throat> so what's the battle here? Well, this is a very interesting battle. Um, they're not really open, so often they're not open licensed, they're not openly accessible often when they finish, so you can't take them and do what you want with them. Uh, they're very commercially driven, uh, a lot of them anyway, adoption of open, so they're open because it puts bums on seats. Um, so last, at the end of last year, many of you will have seen the, the, the famous Sebastian Thrum pivot interview where he sort of suddenly said, uh, Udacity is a lousy product, we're losing too many people, they're not completing, and we're going to become a, a, an e-learning sort of corporate training company, basically. And he kind of felt that once... Uh, venture capitalists start getting a bit twitchy about return on their money, then openness is, is the first casualty. So it's not they're not really based on openness as a as a solid principle. It's just a, a convenience factor, if you like. There's been uh, complaints about some of the contracts that universities are made to sign with some of these providers and they're, they're quite prohibitive and exclusive. There's a, there's an obvious issue around support for learners. I mean that the reason MOOCs are free is because we're not paying people to support them. Um, and that's okay, but Quite often, the very if you want to do this kind of massive, the, the, the card people play with MOOCs, you hear people like Daphne Collins talk about it, it's this kind of mass democratisation of education. But often, those very people you want to meet, to reach, are the people who need uh, support and help. Um, there's issues around uh, putting everything onto kind of centralised platform and, and them then owning the data rather than you having access to that data and you owning the, the, the technology and the platforms. Uh, and in some ways, there's a, it's not really if you're a venture capitalist, uh, diversity isn't really in your interest, market diversity. You want to be the, the Microsoft or the Apple of, of MOOCs. So you want everyone to be on your platform. Uh, and there's an issue around sustainability. I think, you know, at the moment, vice chancellors feel they need to be doing something about MOOCs. Uh, in two or three years' time, when they've been paying, you know, £100,000 for people to develop MOOCs, and it's not really led to much in terms of increased student numbers, they might be asking, you know, what's, the, what's the use of them? What's the point of them? And my last of the four areas is that of uh, open scholarship. And there I'm sort of talking about kind of general open practice of, uh, uh, of people in higher education. Um, I think we're kind of seeing lots of things now. So you know, I've been a blogger since 2005, 2006, and it really was just a pastime for, for weirdos then, you know. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's much more kind of recognised practice now. Uh, having online identity, having an online identity is, is sort of seen as the norm, really. Uh, it's increasingly recognised by institution, even if they don't necessarily recognise it in terms of promotion. But they want, you know, they recognise and promote the pit there. They're kind of star academics and have a good online profile. Um, I think the good stuff is it's really starting. We can see evidence it, it complements existing practice. So um, it's, you know, it's not just about it's necessarily in competition with what we do. So it'll get you more keynote invites. It will get you higher citations on your 
uh, um, traditional papers, those kind of things. Um, you're also seeing that it becomes increasingly important part of uh, when you're putting together research bids and research profiles is what will be your online dissemination practice. So in the OER Research Hub, you know, we've got uh, you know, the blog forms a central part of what we do. We've got a video channel. We do these webinars. We've got a, a Twitter account and stuff. So all that's part of you know, was part of the bid we put together, really. So it seems an important part for for disseminating the the, the research. Uh, I think perhaps the, one of the most interesting areas it's a real area of innovation for academics. You can try stuff out online, which you can't always do um, in your in your physical location. Um, and so we're seeing. Uh, Things like open research, using open methods online to, to generate research, uh, distribution of data, making data openly available, and then recombining it and doing different things with it. So, what's the, the battle area here? It's kind of really within education itself, I think, often. Um, so, promotion can, they're still not sure what to do about uh, an online profile. You know, does it, does it equate to so many publications, is it a nice extra, or do we not care about it? I think there's often a tension with your discipline, um, and so there might be particular journals you're meant to publish in, and uh, if they're not open access, or if you're doing this other stuff, you're told don't mess about with uh, blogging or those kind of things. You know, concentrate on these particular journals. Um, and one of the downsides, I think, I mentioned that institutions are becoming more aware and, and about having academics having an online identity. And in some ways, that creates a pressure to have an online identity. I think it's okay for me, and I work in educational technology. It's not a particularly controversial area, but you know, I've got colleagues who work in climate change or you know, Middle Eastern politics, where if you're, if you're encouraging those people to have an online identity, you're potentially opening them up to a quite you know, an area where where trolls are you know abound, and it, and what's the What's the duty of care from the institution then if, if you're sort of forcing people to have that online identity? There is a kind of exposure to risk there. There's this idea of you know the quantified self, so everything's about a score. What's your? It used to be technorati rating, but it's not the technorati rating. You know, what's your clout score, or whatever? And you kind of get the feeling that uh, just like we've we've learned how to game uh, citation indices, perhaps we'll learn how to game all these alt metrics as well. <coughs> um, and it's not without cost either. I mentioned open data. I mean, it's okay to release perhaps um, the the data from a geology experiment. You know, if you've been crushing rocks, I can release my data. But if I've been doing you know interviews with um, victims of domestic violence, that's that's not such easy stuff to release as open data. And just making data anonymised that you can release openly. Is a cost in itself, and it, and it can be very hard work. And, and there's some debate about whether uh, it's even possible to, to actually anonymise data properly. <coughs> Those are my four areas. I want to have a little rant about uh, the, the battle for narrative now, because I think it, it's it's quite an important one. And it's, it's about you know, if, if you don't tell your story, then someone else will tell it for you. Uh, so some of you will see my blog post on this. Um, the idea of what I, I think was the kind of Silicon Valley narrative, which has become kind of all pervasive. Everything has people up will often hold up startup companies as the, as the thing that we should all aim to be like. So the Silicon Valley narrative, I think, goes something like this. They say, you know, that there's a technological fix out there. Uh, it's up to external forces to come in and disrupt. They love disruption an existing sector. Um, Wholesale revolution is required. You know, there's no point coming along just doing some minor tinkering and being useful. It's got to be wholesale revolution, and that solution is often a, a commercial one. So, uh, as Billy says, uh, technological solutionism. It's exactly that kind of solutionism um, approach. Um, so, one of the so one of the things that's required for this is, you know, the people in the sector can't be trusted, and it's time for a big change. So, you often see that. Paraphrases. Education is broken. So, I've got a few quotes from different articles here. So, people will say this, you know, as fact, you know, similar to you know, uh, distance of the, the sun from the earth. You know, the education space is massive, very broken. Uh, so, there was the the, um, the avalanche report that came out last year. You know, said that the models of higher education that marked Trump and across the globe in the second half of the 20th century are broken. You know, fact. There we are. We can all move on. Uh, 
David's favourite from Degreed.com, a company that was an educational start. And these need always come from educational startups. You know, education is broken, and I happen to have the solution. So you know, they had a, they had a, a campaign, a, a marketing campaign, which is edu education is broken. Someone should do something. Uh, Sebastian Thran, our favourite, says um, education is broken. Face it, it is so broken at so many ends. It requires a little bit of Silicon Valley magic. I mean, that's just the Silicon Valley narrative in in a quote there. Uh, if if he didn't exist, I'd have to make him up. Um, and Clay Shirky, you know, again, is, is not something like the education space is massive, and very broken. So it's sort of, there we are. So education is broken, therefore we need a solution to it. And, and that's not to say that there aren't problems with education, but uh, they never really identify what those problems are. You know, that would be too messy. <coughs> I think there's um, Later, there's also this kind of disruption obsession. They just, uh, you know, Clayton Christensen's work on disruption was, was kind of interesting, um, but it's become sort of devalued to the point where it's almost meaningless now. So everyone talks about everything disrupting the sector now. So uh, Christensen himself has said disruption is a necessary and overdue chapter in public schools. Uh, the Avalanche report again kind of justified itself by saying that, uh, in Christensen's terms, universities are ripe for disruption. Uh, and Courtemire, um was critical of uh, OERs because they hadn't been disruptive. You know, only disruption counts is, is the kind of underlying message here. So this kind of created a, a perfect storm for the media, really, around MOOCs in a way. Um, so you have this thing, uh, education is broken. It's right for disruption. We all know that. MOOCs are a technological solution and they're mainly driven by outsiders and come along. So it was kind of too too good to be true for a lot of So that's why I think MOOCs kind of broke through into, into the mainstream media. You know, there's a nice little story to tell around bringing all these things together. Um, and I think that's probably why, for instance, OERs didn't get as much, because you know, OERs come from inside uh, education. They weren't really saying um, that education was broken. They were saying this is a good way to advance, here are opportunities, you know, so um, Mike Crawford talks about, you know, uh, if you phrase stuff as, as a, a narrative of crisis, then um, you've got to say, we've got to come along and fix it, whereas if you, if you frame stuff as a narrative of opportunity, that's not quite as so sexy, but there are, and it also that's a bit more encouraging to people within a sector. So how we talk about these things is very important for the solutions to come along. And there's some good psychology work on this, you know, they give people different metaphors, and depending on the metaphors they give people, they will come up with different solutions. So if you talk about um, inner city kind of uh, problems as a cancer, then people often, the solutions they come up with will be things like come along and, and sweep away um, you know, inner city areas and build new ones, like cut them out, those kind of solutions. Whereas if you talk about you know, inner city breakdown as a kind of a community issue, then the solutions people come to are much more about kind of working with those communities and building them up. So, so the language is important, I think. <clears throat> okay, so that's my little rant about uh, the narrative. <laughs> um, having said all this, um, I think there's some things we need to avoid doing. I think that what I want to avoid is this kind of open Stalinism. There's, there's only one way to be open, and this is it. And if you're not like this, we're going to out you as not being open enough. So I think that kind of puts people off a lot. And you see a lot of that with the open source uh, community. What I, you know, for me, the, the interesting thing about openness is that it allows people to try different things and do different things. So I wouldn't want to replace one kind of monoculture of how to do stuff with another monoculture of how to do stuff. But I appreciate that's a kind of fine line to tread sometimes. <clears throat> I would say uh, beware of the following things. So open washing. So people talk about green washing there where you kind of say that the new uh, Airbus jet is green because it's cut down slightly on <laughs> emissions. Like, well, no one really thinks that flying airplanes is green. You know, it's, it's a strange claim to make. So uh, people make uh, similar claims about openness. You know, so it's, so the, what that tells you is that open is a commercially viable term. You know, so people want to claim to be open because it's worth money to them. So beware of things pretending to be open. Uh, beware of free equals open. People often make that mistake. Um, and that, and that's only one aspect of openness. Uh, beware of temporary openness. You know, we're open until it gets a bit awkward and then we're not so open. Uh, beware of venture capitalists bearing open gifts. I think, you know, yeah, we're great to, you know, openness is a way to get bums on seats and then we'll see. Uh, and as I just kind of 
banged on about, beware of that, that Silicon Valley sexiness that says no. Now is the time for wholesale disruption. Okay, so wrapping up. So, and this is the bit that, you know, if you can disagree with me on, I think we can disagree with me on any, any bit, really. Uh, openness, I think, isn't just a peripheral interest anymore. It's really moved into mainstream academic practice. I don't, I don't mean that all academics are banging on about MOOCs and OERs all the time, but you hear it much more now, and open access publishing and having an online identity, you know, it's pretty hard to avoid in a lot of, um, a lot of academia now. And so I think much of the future direction of higher education relates to openness. And so this is the big denouement. I think ownership over that direction is relevant to everyone in higher education because if we don't own it, then uh, other people will own it for us. And that's kind of what happened with publishing before. We kind of let the publishers take over the uh, university presses and we let them sort of build up with, uh, with e-publishing informing that we weren't really in charge of, of the publishing industry anymore or of our own content. And I think the same will happen with openness. So that's pretty much it. Uh, some links for you. So uh, I said I'm writing this book. The kind of first chapter sets out most of the argument, uh, and I published that as an article in Jimes. So you can go there. Uh, I'm blogging some bits as I go along, so they're under that, uh, the battle tag over my blog, so you can see those. Um, I'm publishing with Ubiquity Press. They seem like good guys, so uh, you can have a look at them. I mentioned the research hub, you can go to their, to their blog and website or, or the impact map. Um, so I'll stop there and allow any questions. Good point, David. Yes, the book will be made. That would be good, isn't it? No, it's not open access. I don't believe in that stuff. Uh, yes, the book's going to be uh, open access. Um, so I think in all their kind of electronic formats, PDF and uh, EPUB and stuff. So you pick are good, actually. So they do this thing where um, so it, you do kind of alter page, but it's a one-off fee that they don't really care um, about ongoing sales from those. So the, the profits for those sales come to either you as an author or they have a, a fund where you can put those profits into which create a, an, an open access fund for writers from developing countries and stuff. So they seem like good guys. Uh, it was in open practice, the Peter and Demon article. It's called A History of Openness. That's a good question from Mark. He says, do you think the MOOC launch, burn, realistic path has damaged OER? In some ways, um, it's a good thing. You know, it's like, so you couldn't get meetings about open education before, and suddenly everyone wants, wants a piece of it. But then you inevitably have the backlash, and we're already seeing that now. And it's like, it hasn't changed the world. Hold on. Oh, you lied to us. Um, probably by the same people who kind of overhyped it in the first place. So I think if you can use it you know, in, a, in a positive way, then it's increased profile. And, and you know, we shouldn't be too snooty about it, you know, millions of people are finding interesting stuff to learn online, that's not a bad thing, that's what we wanted, you know, so let's not get too uh, down about it. Um, so I think there'll be a bit of backlash about it, but it's just us to kind of build on and, and, and do that. So I, I know lots of people who have had previous research projects rejected, they're digging them out again and you know, doing search and replace for OER or open course with MOOC and there you go, you're, you're good to roll again. Uh, David's question, what I think of future learn, open learn, doing both. Um, yeah, I think there's there's room for both. I think that uh, obviously people like different, I think people like courses, people like stuff like top into a course. Um, I think, you know, we don't know yet, so we've got pretty good data about open learn and that has quite a good um, conversion rate from people coming there and then sign up for formal courses. It's too early to tell with future learn, so 
you know, which is the more successful approach. We, we don't know, but I think you know, they both have their place. You know, I've got, I've got no, you know, no, no downsides on either one at the moment. I think that as long as they're being done and, and there's a kind of commitment to them, that's good. Okay, that's people happy to wrap up there. Um, I'll leave you all to go off and I'll go and find that glass of white wine that helps my writing. Uh, too early for that. Uh, thank you, everyone.